Nothing holds out the hope for a win on climate, a near-term win on climate that can help us to springboard off of that to deeper reductions that are needed to fully stabilize climate change. It is a very powerful pollutant in the atmosphere uh, that triggers a lot of warming over a very short period of time. The really exciting thing though is also tied to that short life in the atmosphere. If we're able to get reductions in methane today, we can actually see a benefit to the climate within our lifetimes. If we're successful in achieving that reduction, it would knock off 0.2 degrees Celsius from the temperature increase that we're feeling right now. When you say 0.2, it sounds like oh, that's a tiny little number. But when you're talking about one degree of warming, knocking off 0.2 is actually a huge, huge deal. Jonathan Banks, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you. So, folks, Jonathan Banks is the global director of the methane program for the Clean Air Task Force. Jonathan, did I get that correct? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Okay, terrific. And folks, as we dive into this, we're going to be linking uh, to all the links necessary to lead you to the content that we discuss and that you can follow even further because um, there are many paths to follow on this topic. Uh, so you can learn more about Jonathan's work and the Clean Air Task Force as we go into this. Um, but we are here to talk about methane, methane emissions and uh, the challenge that they pose to uh, climate change. And, and underneath that challenge, the opportunity to correct some of those problems. Um, so John, with that, let's, um, let's just dive right in with the problem. Uh, if you could, uh, and I know it, <laughs> it alone is a massive topic, but methane and climate change, what are we looking at? So methane is, uh, is a pollutant that is, is known by a, a term uh, which is short-lived climate pollutant. Um, it is a very powerful pollutant in the atmosphere uh, that triggers a lot of warming over a very short period of time. So basically what happens is methane goes into the atmosphere, has a really intense impact on climate change for about 20 years, and then it falls out, in, out of the atmosphere and gets absorbed into the system. This is different from carbon dioxide, which is the other really big um, global warming pollutant, which can last for you know, as much as a thousand years. So um, the impact of methane is really short, but really, really intense. It's um, about 80 times, it's a little more than 80 times more potent in warming the climate than carbon dioxide. Um, uh, and so the impact of methane to climate is, is quite large. Um, it's the second largest impact on, our, on global warming. Currently, the world has warmed approximately one degree uh, Celsius, about half a degree of that uh, impact that we're feeling today is caused by methane emissions. Um, the really exciting thing though is also tied to that short life in the atmosphere. Because CO2 has such a long life, if we are trying to reduce emissions of CO2, we don't see a benefit very quickly because it, you know, what we've emitted today takes so long to disappear out of the atmosphere it has a long, long impact. Whereas methane, if we're able to get reductions in methane today, we can actually see a benefit to the climate within our lifetimes, at least within you and I's lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of the audience is probably able to see a lot more benefit. Uh, but in two decades, we can see a dramatic change in, um, in the impact to climate from methane reductions that we might achieve today. And so I think that's the really exciting and optimistic side of this, you know, because climate change can be such a daunting thing. And it seems like there's not, a lot of times it seems like there's a, not a lot that we can do to impact climate in our lifetimes. But methane's really exciting because it has that ability to start to bend the curve on climate. 
to start yeah. to see progress towards reducing emissions and meeting the goals that we've set for ourselves as a planet to contain this. And so I think that's the really positive aspect of it is there's, there's, there's hope in here and, it, and it's all relatively easily done. It doesn't take a whole lot of newfangled technology to achieve it. Yeah. And we're going to, folks, we're going to get to, um, uh, first of all, thank you, Jonathan, for summing up the entire thing, both the, in, in the sort of the fearful problem that methane causes, but also this incredible, and I think you're, you're framing it exactly as I had read it, largely through a lot of work that you and others have done, the potential and the hope involved because of getting it out. Um, folks, we're going to get to how, how that can be tackled in some ways that are, I'm not sure simple is the right word, but technologically not all that challenging um, and others that are. Uh, but before we, so we're going to get to that, Jonathan, before we get to that, I'd love to, I want to just make sure that I'm framing the conversation for myself and others clearly in terms of methane, because there are many sources of methane into the atmosphere. And there's one in particular that I'm coming into this wanting to focus on, but I want to make sure that we're talking about the same one. So, um, and which is the oil, oil and gas exploration and use. Um, and, uh, but I, I should leave it to the expert. Um, the contributions of methane, and am I right that we're, that that's the yeah. one that we're, yeah. Yeah, so there's, there's, a, there's just a few major sources of methane, um, uh, human-caused methane emissions in, um, in, in the world. Um, the oil and gas sector uh, is a very large source of, uh, of methane emissions. Um, the, another large source is the, um, the agriculture sector, and the agriculture sector is quite diverse in, in the sources of methane emissions. You have um, uh, emissions from cows, um, so the burps of cows actually are methane. Um, also, you get a lot of methane from the manure of cows. Um, then there's well, also within the agriculture space, you have methane that comes from rice. So it's a very diverse uh, system in, in the ag agriculture space. In, um, in the other sources, you have methane that comes from coal mining. Um, so in coal, um, in the coal seams that uh, companies are mining, there is methane trapped in the coal. And when they mine that coal, that methane gets released into the atmosphere. Um, it's incidentally what leads to, you know, coal mine explosions. It's the methane that's released from the coal that ignites that causes coal mine explosions. Um, the canary in the coal mine that was designed to detect mm -hmm. methane. Um, and then um, the other, the other major source is landfills um, and, and waste that goes to landfills. Uh, so at a landfill, you're getting methane emissions when you send organics. So any kind of food product um, uh, that is sent to uh, the landfill, when it starts to decompose, it releases methane to the atmosphere at the landfill site. So those are the major sources of human-caused methane emissions um, in, in the environment. Wonderful. Well, thank you for laying that out so clearly. I, um, my assumption in, in, in having this conversation with you um, and some of the things that I have planned to talk to you about is that we'll be focusing largely on the oil and gas sector. Um, if at any point during that it applies to other some of the other pieces, please, please correct me. Um, and folks, that's not to say that the other areas aren't important because, um, but, it, and, and, it, and I'm, I, I hope and expect to be doing shows on the agricultural piece of this, on um, the coal mining piece, on you know, on these, on the on the landfill piece, certainly, um, as we go forward, because it's all obviously a part of the 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 problem. Um, but a lot of the rest of this conversation, I think, anyway, will be focused on the oil and gas exploration, uh, um, um, not mining, um, drilling, and use. Um, and again, Jonathan, if I'm wrong as we go through that, please do correct me. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and so knowing that it's this huge problem, methane, but also with this powerful potential as a solution, um, and looking at the oil and gas methane emissions, first we got to find them. 
And my understanding of this problem, this where we things are right now is, and you all in particular have, have released some really powerful content on this, um, that there's a lot more of it happening than was previously either known or admitted to, <laughs> depending on how you want to look at it. And um, and I guess my my where I'd love to go is how do we find it? And I, I think this is where I think it gets really interesting and and there's a little um, kind of exciting and, and fascinating work on, on how to find the methane emissions. We'll, we'll get to again, how to stop it and, and all that, but finding the methane emissions, talk to me about that. And I, uh, yeah. Yeah. So when, when you're walking down the street and a big diesel bus or truck drives by and it's spewing black smoke out the back end of it, it, you don't have you don't have to be a scientist or uh, or or anything else to be able to know. Hey, there, there's a problem right there. Um, that's the kind of pollution sources that we're traditionally we've traditionally been focused on. Is the things that we can see, the things that pollute our water, the things that we can see going into the air. Um, one of the problems that methane faces is it's invisible. Um, you and I can't see it. Um, in most cases, it doesn't have a smell. And unless it's a really, really big emission source, it doesn't have a sound either. You know, you're not gonna hear it, you're not gonna smell it, you're not gonna see it. So to be able to find methane uh, emissions uh, in the oil and gas sector, um, you need um, technologies that allow you to see this. Um, traditionally, um, Companies would use all sorts of different ways to try to um, see leaks. Um, they use things like soap bubbles. They go around and they uh, take a bucket of uh, water and a bar of soap and they smear little bubbles around valves to see if you know it swelled up. Kind of if you've ever fixed a flat tire on your bicycle, it's the same thing you do there. Um, uh, but um, a couple of decades ago, uh, technology um, was developed. Um, using um, what we call optical gas imaging. Um, and this is a special kind of camera that um, has been calibrated on the infrared spectrum to be able to see methane emissions. Um, it, it sees things at a different, in a different way than our human eye does and different from a regular camera as well. It's similar to infrared cameras that people are more familiar with that are picking up heat, but this, this is calibrated to a different part of the infrared spectrum where methane um, resides. And so it takes what looks like a clear image uh, on a regular camera and through your eyes, and it shows you immediately the pollution that's coming from the site. It's, fascinating to see how this changes people's minds about this um, problem and how it can drive action. Um, these cameras, they look like an old timey video camera, uh, but they are extremely fancy. Uh, and you turn that on and immediately you can see where the emissions are coming from. You know, sometimes it's little small leaks coming out of a, a valve um, sometimes they're very large uh, emission sources that are coming out of something that's either broken or left open. Um, but these, uh, this camera allows us, we have uh, two of these cameras, allows us and allows others who have the cameras to be able to see the, in, the emissions that are happening and to, to show the world what's going on. Um, one of the sad things things about this is most of the time when we turn this camera on, we're seeing emissions. It's, it's not something where it's hard for us to find emissions. We're finding them you know, on a regular basis in almost every place we turn the camera on, we're seeing emissions. Yeah. The other really exciting technological developments in this space that are leading to um, uh, this are in an area um, which is called remote sensing. Um, and so you know, direct sensing is, you know, walking around with this camera and pointing it and stuff. Remote sensing gets into some really cooler technologies, things like using drones with these kinds of cameras attached to them or airplanes with these kinds of um, 
uh, equipment attached and other kinds of equipment that can sense methane. And then even up to the, the higher space of satellites. And currently we have a few satellites in the uh, uh, coming around uh, Earth that allow us to see some methane emissions. Uh, if it's a big enough source, we can see methane emissions from the satellites. But there's a, several satellites that are about to be launched in the next year and a half, two years, that will give us much greater clarity to those emissions, much greater coverage for the planet, you know, almost universal coverage of the planet, not quite, uh, but allow us to get um, regular images from a whole lot of the planet that shows us the magnitude of the problem and is able to identify large sources and, and medium-sized sources around the planet. So that's, that's how this is evolving. And you know, those, all of those technologies are gonna be layered onto each other you know, because the satellite can see the really big stuff, the airplanes can see some, you know, um, smaller stuff, and then the handheld devices on the ground will be able to, um, to be able to see, you know, the smallest things. The other element that's being mixed in on the detection side of things is there's a lot of work going into developing um, continuous emissions monitoring is what we call it. And so you can think of this like a smoke detector in your house, um, uh, or a radon detector in your house, having a device that's essentially like that, that's located at these facilities that can detect immediately when there's a problem and it's connected into the cellular network. So it's communicating back to the company and immediately the company knows there's a problem. This is like one of these areas, all of this detection technology is just rapidly evolving. It's super exciting and fun to see how, um, you know, technology providers are coming at this and, and really starting to focus on what we can do to change this dynamic. Um, and this is a space where the more we know about this, um, the more action it drives. You know, the, the, the magnitude of the problem is a much greater problem than anything we've uh, ever anticipated. There's a lot yeah. of estimates of methane emissions, but when we finally actually do like real uh, analysis with uh, the cameras and the planes and satellites, we find that emissions are a lot higher than anything of what we, what we thought. And I can give you a few examples, but I'll pause there and let you <laughs> jump in because I know I'm going on. No, I, I, well, I have had no reason to interrupt you because you're, you're, again, you're, you're telling us such a clear tale. And then that brings us very naturally, I think, um, to, again, what I'm calling the human element, or the, the, I guess it's really the kind of the political element of it, which is, it seems to me that to the extent we haven't known where the emissions are, there's kind of two broad reasons. One, you know, just people that haven't known to look or haven't taken the time to look and when alerted may, you know, may adopt the technology and, and want to look. And in other cases, perhaps a little bit more cynically, um, just no, no, there's no problem here whether they know it or not, and just wanting to like, and I think this is uh, my understanding is that at, whether it's at the company scale, the regional scale, or the country scale, uh, different actors on both sides, again, either, either happy to do something when they know, but haven't had the cause or taken the time to look, and others that may be acting a little bit more, you know, cynically saying, nothing to see here, move on that these technologies all the way up to those pinpoint satellites can start to say, well, actually that's not true. Am I mischaracter? Again, I want, I'm stepping a little carefully because I don't want to mischaracterize it. No, I, I, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think the, the data that these technologies create um, help to overcome what we call barriers in the system. Mm -hmm. um, they help to um, overcome those barriers and Throughout the oil and gas system, so let me step back just a second. When, when you reduce methane emissions in the oil and gas space, it's important to note that methane is basically natural gas. You know, natural gas is methane. They're the same thing. That's just basically two different names. Um, but when, so when you reduce methane in the oil and gas space, when you're stopping that gas from going to the atmosphere, you're keeping that gas as a product for the gas company. 
So there's an economic benefit to the company to keep that gas in the pipeline. And one of the reasons that achieving reductions in the oil and gas sector is um, seen as relatively easy is because of that fact that by keeping it from going to the atmosphere, I have something additional that I can make money off of. And you can see these cost curves of how much it costs to fix things, you know, at various places in the, in the oil and gas system. And a lot of that stuff is profitable. It means it doesn't actually cost money. Um, it saves money. So you're making money by fixing these leaks. The stuff that actually costs money doesn't cost much. And so then the question is, why aren't they doing this anyways? If there is a value to the at least the stuff that's profitable, why aren't they doing it? The reasons they don't do it are what we call barriers. And there's a lot of barriers that um, prevent companies from doing what they should be doing. Um, and that would be you know a full two hour long discussion probably to go through all the barriers. But there's really strange things like, um, you know, having a company that owns a pipeline, but the gas that's flowing through the pipeline is owned by someone else. And the way that the contract's written, um, the guy that owns the pipeline is allowed to lose some gas and he doesn't have any loss on his contract. So there's no incentive for him to go out there and work on this. Um, the, another thing that we run into a lot is within a company um, if you and I are both in the company and we both have projects that we want uh, money from the inside of the company to work on, your project is to go drill a well and my project is to fix leaks in, uh, in the existing system, your profit is higher than my profit. Even though mine's profitable, you're going to get the money and I'm not going to get the money. Um, and so this is called rate of return on investment. And there's um, uh, that these rules exist within companies. And so they don't prioritize yeah. this stuff. Um, and so um, the, the human, the barriers in the human system and the economic system are real and they have to be overcome. And the technology that exists today is something that begins to overcome those barriers. It's not the only thing that helps to overcome them. We have to move from just the realization of the magnitude of the problem. That no longer can you hide behind the fact that they're, oh, you can't see anything, so there's no emissions. Yeah. These things say, oh, well, guess what? There's a lot of emissions and we need to fix this. And so it puts it front and center for the companies and the policymakers, and it starts to force the action to, to take place. Yeah, wonderful. And 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 so with the technologies now showing, okay, this is the problem, here's the magnitude of the problem, and either internally or through political reasons, you're going to need to you're going to need to do something about it. Um what are some, what are some of the mechanisms that are starting to unfold assuming, you know, to to <laughs> encourage to to change the dynamic on those incentives within a company. So, obviously I'm thinking of I guess regulations international trade law, I think that's come up around this a little bit. What are some of the mechanisms that are either have come online or being looked at to change that dynamic so that so that these folks will address the problem? Absolutely. Um, so the first is laws and regulations. Um, regulations that force companies to take action. Again, often the actions that they're taking will end up being profitable to the company, but the regulation itself forces the company to prioritize the methane mitigation over something else. Um, it does. What ends up happening is that the regulations um, don't um, don't cause huge headaches and uh, pocketbook aches for uh, the companies. It makes them readily implementable, um, readily achievable. Um, so that's the, that's the first piece. Um, and that's something that we work on a global basis to help countries and subnational governments develop these policies that drive the change in the industry. 
uh, to force them to reduce their methane emissions. Um, the other the other things that are working that are starting to come uh, forward that are that will help drive change. There's a global recognition um, that has built over the last year and a half of this problem um, mm -hmm. at the uh, highest levels of the, um, the, the climate discussions. The issue of methane has been put on the table as a priority that must be addressed and needs to be addressed um, now. And that's, that's being driven by you know, the hopefulness that I talked about earlier, the fact that if we can reduce methane emissions, we can start to bend the curve on climate. And, you know, I look at this from a human perspective, you know, climate change is one of those issues. If you work on it for a while, you can get really depressed yeah. uh, because it feels like you're banging your head on a tree um, and the tree's not going anywhere and your head's starting to really hurt. Um, you never feel like you're making any progress. Um, methane holds out the hope for a win on climate a near-term win on climate that can help us to springboard off of that to deeper reductions that are needed to fully stabilize climate change. So this international um, uh, collection has come together in something known as the Global Methane Pledge, um, which uh, currently has 111 countries um, in support of. And this is a pledge by these countries to reduce methane emissions collectively by 30% by 2030. Um, this is not just oil and gas. Um, this is oil and gas, uh, coal, landfills, um, agriculture. Um, the majority of those reductions are likely to come from the oil and gas sector, but um, it's a collective 30% uh, reduction. Um, that reduction, um, if we are to, if we were successful in achieving that reduction, it would knock off 0.2 degrees Celsius from the temperature increase that we're feeling right now. When you say 0.2, it sounds like oh, that's a tiny little number. <laughs> but when you're talking about one degree of warming, knocking off 0.2 is actually a huge, huge deal. Yeah. Um, and so um, those kind of that kind of collective action at that you know, global scale is also helping to accelerate change. But then, as you alluded to, there's also trade agreements and purchasing agreements that are starting to be explored um, that can accelerate action. Um, for instance, in the European Union, Europe buys more gas than anybody else in the entire world um, that, that they import. Um, and they, because of all the gas that they buy, they have the potential and they're currently developing policies around this, they have the potential to develop policies that help drive methane mitigation on a global scale from all the people that they buy gas from. They can say to those countries, we wanna buy gas that has methane controls in place and that will drive action um, in places like Algeria and Qatar and Nigeria, even the United States where they buy a lot of gas from in Russia, although, the Russia pieces. We'll we'll set that aside for now. <laughs> yeah, that's a <laughs> that's a whole other issue. Um, other but, variables at stake, but yeah. Yes. But so so, so the, these countries can now say yes, we'll buy your gas, but it it's got to come sort of certified methane release free, kind of. I mean, <laughs> to put it, yeah, like that's yeah. what they're getting at. And again, for the audience, the, a reminder: this is, I think, where I think that the technology, the the finding it technology is so important because the only way that that can happen is if the countries can say, yep, yes, you've, you know, because they can say, well, of course it's methane free, here you go, buy it. But yeah. and now because of these satellites and the technology, they can say, that's not true. You know, satellite X is telling us blank yep. and it can be certified and proven and quantified so that this international trade agreements that you're talking about can actually happen, I'm, right? Yep. Is that? You're absolutely yeah. right. It comes full circle connecting both yeah. of the um, pieces. Um, the satellites and all of the remote sensing technologies will give us that capability to, um, to um, fully capture the emissions from any, any place on earth, really, 
um, and to um, and to be able to construct these new policy options. Um, you know, we've we've ha- we have a number of years. Um, you know, going back to like the first policies at the you know state level in the United States uh, in 2015 um, or 2014. I may have my year off uh, there, uh, but um, going back many years of you know, specific policies that control, you know, what's in your boundaries. Um, but the, the remote sensing technologies give us that ability to develop new policies that um, can spread action on a, a much more global scale. Um, and so I think that's a really exciting area. And it's an exciting area that connects the policy, the science and the technology um, into kind of you know, one really um, promising area. Yeah, and and as a little aside to my audience or to our, our audience, it's your audience too. Um, I I think it's exciting too because it also proves what I what I believe is that one of the foundational pieces for heroes of the twenty first century is your potential to impact this change. There, you know, you can be a, maybe you're a drone operator. Maybe maybe you've lo- fell in love with space as a child and want to be working on space exploration, you know, it's another one of those areas where it shows like so many different avenues of a professional career where you can follow that passion and still have a huge impact on the topic of climate change. And I think any number of those avenues are surfacing in this conversation. So I, another reason, yeah, another reason that I love the topic. Um, We should, I, 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 we should start to wrap up a little bit here, but I want to, we haven't talked much and we we don't want to get, I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but I want to at least hint to the audience. Um, we've talked about finding it and convincing people to stop the problem. I'd like to talk a little bit about stopping the stopping the problem. And to me, as I understand it, and this is where now we're sort of in the technical realm, and there's the short term and the longer term. And the short term, as, as far as I understand it, I mean, and I think in one of the articles that I read last fall that, and I think in which you were maybe one of the voices quoted, and I'm not saying this was your quote, but in that article, someone alluded to, it's essentially a plumbing problem, right? It's not like a highly technical fix once the problems are spotted in the short term. Am I, in terms of these emissions or uh, the flares, et cetera, talk to us a little bit about that short term. We found it, how do we stop it? Yeah, yeah, that is me Um, trying to simplify it maybe uh, (laughs) too much, but I, I always I always tell everyone, um, you know, this isn't rocket science; it's plumbing. And of course, we were just talking about rocket science, you know, with satellites <laughs> yeah. and stuff like that. But that's the that's the detection side of the things. But yeah. the fixing side of the things isn't rocket science; it's yeah. it's plumbing and 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 good practices. Um, and you know, most of the problems that are identified. You know, like with the cameras, the optical gas imaging cameras, it, when, when you survey a site, yeah, most of the problems that are identified can be fixed on the site that very moment. Um, in fact, um, the data that we have back from, the, um, from some of the states like Colorado um, that has been working on this for Colorado has been working on this longer than any other state in the United States. Um, but the data that we have back from Colorado um, shows that 99% of the leaks that they identify are fixed that same day. Um, oh. The reason they're fixed is because half the time it's tightening something up. It's, yeah. oh, this, um, this flange on this thing needs to be replaced. Oh, we fix that right now. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, a lot of times the, the, the folks that are out there with the cameras are also uh, empowered to f- do the repairs themselves. And so um, it's really basic maintenance. Sometimes it's it's really crazy thing, not crazy things. It's really simple things like in the oil and gas fields, they have these tanks that hold some of the liquid fuels. Okay. And, and on the top of the tank, there's a little hatch and they call it the thief hatch. Um, but a lot of times the workers will open the thief hatch to check the level of the fluids in there. And sometimes they leave the hatch open. When you leave the hatch open, all the venting of methane just comes spewing out the top. That's a super fix. You just close the hatch. <laughs> um, <laughs> close the refrigerator door. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It's like close the refrigerator door. 
you know, there's things like somebody left a valve open, close the valve, and it's like yeah. turning off the garden hose. You know, yeah. this is the kind of stuff that, you know, it, you know, most of the things that people are finding, that's the stuff you're finding. Um, and it's super simple fixes. There are bigger issues in the system um, that do require more time, do require more technology. I don't want to oversimplify this. Right. Um, one of the things that we have in the oil and gas system is you have a lot of equipment. Some of the equipment is fairly small. Some of it is quite large that by design, like when it was originally designed and if it's functioning perfectly well, it releases gas to the atmosphere okay. because it's just how the system operates. Yeah. So to fix that requires a replacement of that equipment. Now there's some of the things in there, there are little valves. It's like, those are relatively easy and cheap to replace. There's bigger things like these big compressor stations that move the gas through pipelines. Um, uh, the compressor stations, those require a bit more of a big yeah. investment and technical fix. Um, but again, it's all stuff that, you know, it, we know how to do, um, yeah. and is, is, is readily doable. Um, the, um, you know, so that's, that's kind of what you're looking at when you're looking at what about the, what the about stuff. the, oh, forgive me. I'm sorry. Were you, no, go ahead. Go ahead. What, well, the other one is the, the flaring. And this is yes. one that folks, I think if you've ever driven folks where, wherever you might be in the, in, in the, I'm speaking about the U S but in the world. If you drive by any sort of facility, you'll often see, you know, a, a little candle, essential burning a flame, like an Olympic torch, essentially, there on the property burning off. And my understanding is they're flaring off excess methane that's been found, burning it. Which, um, and I don't. I mean, I, I guess I'm, uh, one person not knowing might say, well, that's good. They're burning it and getting eventually getting rid of the methane, but now they're creating. CO2, but now I'm talking myself in circles. So the, no, the no, flaring, no. the flaring piece of this, what, yeah. what, what's, yeah. So flaring, uh, flaring is um, typically used for two things. Um, you know, it's, it's used for um, emergency situations where you need to, in order to maintain a safe uh, workspace, okay. you need to get rid of gas um, in the system. Yeah. And this could be um, there's a problem with the piece of equipment down the way and you can't keep gas flowing through the system. So you right. have to, um, flare the gas out of the system yeah. so that you can fix this piece of equipment down here. Um, it, it's, that stuff is supposed to be temporary and only for emergencies and things like that. Um, there are other instances of flaring they come into play, which we typically refer to more as routine flaring. Um, and this will happen in a lot of different cases, but one of the biggest problems is when a company is looking for oil, um, they will often find gas um, in the same formation. Um, essentially, a lot of times what it is, is the oil, because it's heavier, is down below, and the gas, because it's lighter, sits on top when they drill, the first thing they hit is gas before they get to the oil. It's called associated gas. Um, it's associated with the oil. Um, that gas has traditionally been seen as a waste product by companies. They don't yeah. want it. All they want to do is get rid of it. Um, and the way that they've gotten rid of it in the past was either to vent it to the atmosphere straight or to flare it. Now, if you flare it um, for climate uh, purposes, that is technically better than uh, venting it straight to the atmosphere because you're converting it ostensibly from methane to CO2. So you've reduced the, um, the, mm -hmm. um, the impact to climate um, yeah. somewhat. Um, the problem with a lot of these flares, and this has been shown in a lot of different uh, work uh, recently, scientific work using aerial surveys, is that the flares go out, um, the candle blows out, and then all you've got is a vent stack of methane going to the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, and so the flaring um, is a problem for, um, you know, uh, in a lot of different ways. The other piece of the flaring issue is it doesn't usually burn up all of the gas. Um, okay. You usually have quite a bit of methane that's still coming out that's unburnt. Okay. Um, and it seems to me like the flaring thing 
it, it fits back in that category you're talking about before where ostensibly the company is sitting on a product. Like they've, they found yes. gas, they found oil. The casual observer would say, you found two things. Why not make money off both? Yep. And again, folks, we're gonna, this is a different conversation than we shouldn't, you know, than not wanting to use any of this going forward. Um, but in the short, short term, they found two things and finding that the methane flare releases and, and putting some regulations or other incentives behind it for the company to just say, okay, this isn't what we were looking for, but let's now we have some extra incentive to, to capture it and make it yeah. a useful product rather than just release it to the atmosphere where it becomes this incredibly dangerous greenhouse gas. Is that a fair summation? It is. And what's going on a lot of times is um, poor planning. Um, yeah. Planning is a huge element in, in flaring. Um, companies will be permitted to search for oil without having to have a plan for how they're going to get the gas that they're going to find um, from the well to a pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, and so you go out there, you drill your oil well, you find gas and you don't have a pipeline there to connect the gas to. So you flare it. Now, this could have been solved by requiring the company to come up with a plan for how they're going to get the associated gas from the well to a pipeline. Um, uh, and, um, and, you know, especially in today's energy market where gas prices are quite high, oil prices are quite high, you know, the value of that gas has a tremendous uh, um, impact and we shouldn't be letting companies waste this product into the atmosphere while all of us are paying such high energy prices for everything. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, it's typically an issue of planning um, and requirements uh, for uh, companies uh, to, to deal with this. Um, but again, the, the remote sensing technologies are giving us the ability to see this, see how big this problem is. And um, we will be able to see um, eventually, we're, we already can do it to some degree, but we will be able to see eventually wind flares go out and they're, they become um, methane vents. Um, and so that uh, will be helpful. There's a number of different other ways to try to deal with the flaring issue and to improve it. But um, for the most part, it comes down to, we need uh, to force companies to have a plan for how to deal with this. Yeah. Um, and then we need requirements um, for um, uh, uh, from in regulatory policies that really start to drive down and limit um, to just those few safety instances, um, the flaring that we allow. Um, sure. um, and there are states in the United States that have done this. Um, New Mexico and Colorado both have uh, implemented policies to, um, to start to drive down uh, the problem of flaring, but there's a lot of places that haven't begun to address this. Yeah. Um, I, I want to start to wrap up, Jonathan, so I don't take too much of your time and, and, and um, we give the audience a chance to explore this on their own, on their own time deeper, because there, again, there is so much fascinating stuff to explore on this topic. Um, but I don't want to leave unsaid the big thing that I'm sure many people are thinking, which is, you know, the, the longer term solution, which, you know, like, if, okay, if there's all this methane release associated, and again, we're sp talking specific, or I'm talking now specifically about methane releases related to oil and gas exploration, extraction, and use, Let, you know, it, it's the keep it in the ground. It's, it's looking the forward, you know, transition to renewable energy and, and such um, that ostensibly in the longer term, might will render this source of methane a moot point. Um, I, it, it's a longer term thing, of course. And I, I, I don't know to the extent you have comments on that, to the extent you all are working on that. I, I yeah. yeah it is, no. That of course, in itself is a massive topic. I don't want to let it, that the audience think we're not thinking about it as, as we no. talk about the shorter term things. No, absolutely. Um, I, I think it's a, it's perfectly, um, it's a really important issue to raise. Um, the, the transition, the energy transition um, that um, is, is going on and will accelerate over uh, the coming decades um, is going to take multiple pathways around the world. 
um, in um, in in Europe, um, there is a, a real drive for uh, eliminating the use of fossil fuels uh, by 2035 or 2040. Um, um, the the governments are probably leaning more towards the 2050 time frame, but you know that's kind of a, a span of of, sure. of years. Um, in other parts of the world, um, uh, especially in the global south, in places like Nigeria and uh, in 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 places throughout Latin America, um, where there is um, a um, tremendous reliance on revenue from fossil fuels, um, the transition is going to be at a different pace. Um, mm -hmm. And the way that we have been approaching this and, and you know, we're, we're uh, other parts of my organization are working, you know, hard on, you know, uh, building out renewables and in uh, and energy efficiency and things like that. Um, the way that we've been approaching this is no matter what your vision of when we get off fossil fuels, um, no one no one thinks that we could get off fossil fuels today or tomorrow right. or next week. I mean, it takes time to transition off of fossil fuels because those liquid fuels, especially the liquid fuels, the oil and the gas, um, they make up about 80% of our energy system. Mm -hmm. And to get completely off of those fuels will take time. And it's gonna take different time in different parts of the world than it might take in say California or uh, Belgium or something like that. Yeah. Um, methane, and this goes back to the beginning of the conversation, <laughs> because of its huge, huge impact over 20 years, it we can't let that methane happen. And yeah. so regardless of when you see um, us getting off of fossil fuels, we have to deal with the methane in the interim. Um, and so it forces us to walk and, uh, and chew gum at the same time. Um, uh, we have to be addressing the methane from the fossil fuel sector. At the same time, we're trying to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. Um, they have to go hand in hand. One's a longer term goal. And the other one's really about how do we start to bend the curve on climate change today? And so yeah. that's that's how it, they work in conjunction. And so, and I think I, I my radar, I, I say it in part because, you know, for anyone who sees this work and might have a gut instinct or, a, you know, a, I'd say, why all this work on oil and gas when it's going to go away? And you've outlined wonderfully why, no matter how dearly you want that to happen, this work remains so vitally important to the overall attempt to to curb climate change, and so yeah, that's that's wonderful. Thank, or that, that's that's not wonderful. Your explanation, yes, <laughs> of, it, uh, of it is wonderful and very powerful. Um, I want to just hint at one other thing. I don't want to ask you to go into it because again, we we're, I want to let you go soon. Um, but the other piece of this, folks, and again, there's some powerful reporting done last fall, and I'm sure before that too on it is that even once wells cease to be operational. Um, you, oil and gas wells, the methane remains an issue. And there's a whole piece that was done. And again, I don't, I don't want to, maybe if you know the, 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 the publication, Jonathan. Um, um, no, I can't remember. That, the... Well, I'll link to it so we don't get it okay, wrong. Good. But suffice but it to say, wells, this, folks, yeah. it's, <laughs> even in the day when oil and gas operations are closed down, methane, re, and, and it's happening now, closed oil wells are now they're not pumping oil anymore, but they remain a tremendous source of these problematic methane emissions. So everything we've talked about remains a challenge to be overcome with all the thought and technology and political might that we've just talked about long after an oil well is closed and is no longer used. So I just, I wanted to put that on the table. Um, Jonathan, closing words from you is, as we looked, as you look out to the audience that we're talking to, and let's, let's for a moment focus on the younger folks high school, college, early career, you know, whatever career, whatever passion they might want to pursue in their career. This is a broad question, I know, and it's probably unfair to ask you that, but from your vantage point, the work you're doing, the problems and potential, anything you want to say to that crew? Well, as, as the father of um, a high schooler and um, 
two uh, two kids uh, in in university. Um, you know, I, I have to speak to that crowd a, a lot. Um, and I, I think the, the thing that I want people to take away from this issue um, is, um, is the hopeful nature of it. Uh, because I do think that climate change can be one of those things that, um, that seems so daunting, so unsolvable, um, uh, so intangible. Um, and I think the thing about um, this issue, the issue of methane emission reductions, is it is, it is something that is readily solvable. Um, it is something that if we um, put our heads together and tackle this problem, we can have a huge impact in turning climate change around um, that will um, allow us to avoid some of the most dangerous um, tipping points within the climate system. Um, so I think the thing that I want people to recognize is, is that hope and that opportunity that exists in this space. Um, because the last thing we need is everyone to become disillusioned by um, the, the problem, uh, which is definitely something uh, that, is, that is of concern. Terrific. Well, thank you. I think those are terrific words to, to close on. I just want to thank you, Jonathan, again for, for joining us. Um, and My pleasure. And again, laying out this the all aspects of this issue so, so clearly. Thank you very much. Okay. Have a great afternoon. Take care.